Okay, this explanation is going to be for honors biology, and we'll be talking about photosynthesis. If you are either in AP biology or in regular biology, this explanation is not at the right level for you, so you should check for those other videos instead. Now, for starters, you'll remember from when we were talking about the cell unit that photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. And the chloroplast is this organelle that is found in plant cells in particular. And inside each of the chloroplasts, there are these series of stacked disks. Each stacked disk is what we call a thylakoid, and one giant stack of them is what we call a granum, or grana for plural. And then these thylakoids are made up of these membranes that surround them, the thylakoid membrane. All of this empty space that's around it is called the stroma. So we're going to kind of zoom in on one of these thylakoid membranes, and I'm going to draw a very large thylakoid here for us to kind of talk about what exactly is going on in the rest of photosynthesis. So for starters, as you know, photosynthesis starts when the sunlight is going to shine down upon the organism that is doing photosynthesis. And so it is shining down on my chloroplast and within it, in the thylakoid membrane, there are these proteins here, and these proteins are called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a molecule that is excellent at absorbing sunlight. So the sunlight is coming in, and it is exciting, these chlorophyll molecules. And if you think to, like, when you go to an amusement park, and there is that um, activity where you can go and you take the hammer, you go, whack, and you hit this thing, and it causes a bell to shoot up or a hammer to shoot up and ring a bell up at the very top. That's kind of related to what's happening here. When you go and you hit that thing with your hammer, the energy is coming out of your body. It's getting transferred into that little ringer, and then that energy is being lifted up to a higher level. And when it's up there, all of that energy that was in your swing is now potential energy. It can be used to do work. It could be used to ring the bell, or if you caught it up there at the top and stuck like an egg underneath and let it go, all of that released energy can be used to smash the egg. Now the same kind of thing is going to happen here. The sunlight is going to be striking this chlorophyll, just like you with the hammer, and it's going to be filling it up with tons of energy. And that energy is going to get trapped by the chlorophyll. And the chlorophyll is going to get so full up of energy that one of the electrons that's inside of it is going to be moved to a higher energy level and it's actually going to leave that chlorophyll molecule. It's just going to pop right out of there. So this is kind of like the sun is you, it's got the hammer, it's hitting the chlorophyll molecule, and that electron is filling up with energy, getting so excited that it is just popping right out of the chlorophyll. Now you'll remember when we were talking back about um, organic chemistry and the molecules, they're not stable if they don't have the right number of electrons. So this missing electron from the chlorophyll is going to have to be replaced from somewhere. So the place that it's going to do the replacing it from is water, because of course the plant is drinking plenty of water. Water is coming in and it's going to donate an electron. Specifically, it's the hydrogen that's in here that's going to give its electron. Because you'll remember when we were talking oxygen, it's pretty greedy with its electrons. It does not want to sacrifice any. Hydrogen, on the other hand, it's a tiny little molecule. It gives them up pretty easily. So an electron from this hydrogen is going to be used to replace the excited one that was in my chlorophyll molecule. Now we still have the excited electron, and it's going to be doing stuff, but we're going to hold the thought on that excited electron for now. And let's focus on the water. So when the hydrogen gives up its electron, now those hydrogen are just kind of floating around freely out here. And since they don't have an electron, I'm going to put a plus by them. Because at this point, it's just basically a proton and a neutron. No electron there, which means it's got a positive charge. So there's our two hydrogen that came out of this water molecule. There happen to be plenty of other hydrogen here in the area. There's actually a whole bunch of them inside my thylakoid. So I'm going to draw these in because all of these hydrogen that are inside the thylakoid are going to become pretty important in not too terribly long. So lots of hydrogen inside my thylakoid. 
and more hydrogen getting added outside the thylakoid in the stroma, that's what we call that area, because it's being taken from this hydrogen. Now that hydrogen does not actually have any electrons to share anymore, the oxygen needs a new partner. So two oxygen molecules that have had this happen are going to get together, and these guys are going to be released into the air as waste. So all of the oxygen that you are breathing came from one of these water molecules. The plant split it, the water gave up the electrons, the hydrogen stuck around, the oxygen got released into the atmosphere as waste. So at this point, that's the air that you are going to breathe. And everything that we have talked about here so far, so this splitting of the water molecule, this excited electron, this loss of oxygen, all of this is what we call photosystem two. Now you're probably wondering why we're calling it photosystem two when this was the very first thing that happened. And the simple answer to that is we discovered the second. We already discovered a different photosystem that happens later in the process earlier in time, and so we were already calling that the photosystem. So everybody's used to saying, well, that's the photosystem. This is photosystem two. So basically, let's review what we've got so far. Sunlight gets the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll gets excited, gives up an electron. The hydrogen gives its electron back to the chlorophyll. So now the chlorophyll is stable, and those hydrogens stick around outside in the stroma. Meanwhile, those spare oxygen partner up, they're released into the atmosphere as waste. So, now let's follow up what's happening with this electron. This electron, if you think back to when we were talking about the hammer and the mallet, this is like right up there where it's ringing the bell. It is absolutely loaded with energy, got its maximum amount of energy to spend, and so we are going to spend it doing some active transport. Now you will remember from when we talked before, active transport is any time a molecule is getting moved from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. So when we're looking at these hydrogen molecules, there is a lower amount out here in the stroma. There is a higher amount here inside the thylakoid. And so that's what we're going to spend this energy that's in the electron on. It's going to basically be the payment to get these hydrogen pumped in here where the rest of them already are. And in order to do that, it's going to need the help of some more proteins. So there are tons of proteins floating around here in the membrane of the thylakoid. And these particular proteins are going to go and take some of this energy from the electron, and they're going to use that energy to pump the hydrogen inside. Now, doing it just at once, that's not going to use up all the energy. So we can actually do this a few times. There are several different proteins that all have the job of taking the hydrogen that's in the stroma and pumping it into the thylakoid. So the thylakoid is just getting more and more full of these hydrogen molecules now, because we just keep pumping more in. Now, that did not use up all of the energy from my electron. There's a little bit left over, but we're going to worry about it again in a minute. Not yet. So, the part that we have talked about this time, with the passing of the electron and the doing the active transport, we call all of this the electron transport chain, because it's a chain of, of proteins. They are taking the energy from the electron, and they are transporting this hydrogen, doing active transport from low to high. So the active transport chain is filling up this inside with hydrogen. And this hydrogen wants to go out. So if you think about it, remember, all molecules diffuse. They go from the areas of higher concentration to the areas of lower concentration. But the only way for these hydrogen to get out is if they can find a protein somewhere in the membrane here that's going to let them out. And there happens to be just that kind of membrane protein. And we call this protein ATP synthase. And so basically what's going to happen here is just like a revolving door on a building, these hydrogen are going to start flowing through this molecule. And in order to get out, it's like a revolving door. They have to spin the protein around. So they go through and it spins the protein. Think about how you've seen like water wheels and things like that. When they spin, 
we can go and catch that energy and use it. And so that's exactly what's going to happen here. This molecule is going to be taking this energy that's being released every time the hydrogen moves out, every time it spins it, and it's going to take a molecule called ADP, which is an energy storing molecule that is not storing energy right now, and it's going to combine it with another phosphate group. And all of the energy that's produced by the spinning is going to get put into the bond between these two P's, because ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate, two phosphate groups. Whereas ATP, which is what we're going to make, is three phosphate groups. And it's that third bond there, that one is storing all of the energy. So basically, these two are going to go through the spinning protein also, and that spinning is going to take the energy and link them all together and make ATP. Now, ATP is the most important energy storing molecule in your body, in the bodies of plants, in the bodies of just about any living organism you can think of. That's how we store our energy. This is kind of like a wallet full of American dollars. You can go and pull that energy out and spend it on whatever you want. Once you've spent the money, you're back here where you started. This ADP, that's like our empty wallet. No money in there. You have to go and fill it back up before you can use it again. So this is kind of like your money-making machine. You're going to the bank, you're getting that money, you're putting it in there. Now you've got ATP produced. So this is where most of that sunlight energy is getting captured. You are taking light energy from the sun, using it to excite the electron, do some active transport, and then as that flows back out, capturing that energy one more time in the form of chemical energy. Now, we're almost done, but not quite. Remember how I said that there is still a little bit of energy left over here from this electron. We need to capture the last of that energy that's up there. And so in this case, there's going to be a second molecule. And this molecule is what we call NADP+. NADP plus is a lot like ADP. It's an empty wallet. You can store energy in it, and you can take that energy out and use it later. But the catch is that this is not as useful all over the place. There are only certain chemical reactions where you can use the energy stored version of NADP plus. So ATP, you can use in just about everything. This one, you can only use sometimes. So we'll kind of think of it more like Canadian money. You can take it to the currency exchange, you can get it turned into something more useful, but on its own, it's only useful in certain situations. So, the energy from this electron is going to get combined with the NADP+, and also one of these hydrogen. That's where that energy is coming from. It's not the same hydrogen, so having an arrow up there doesn't quite make sense. But remember, there are a lot of hydrogen floating around out here in the stroma. So one of those hydrogen is going to get joined up with it, and we are going to make the energy storing molecule NADPH, which, like ATP, is the charged up energy filled molecule. So, this last bit where we were making the NADPH, there are actually a couple steps that I left out there that lead up to that point. But those steps combined and resulting in the NADPH, this is what we call photosystem one. So that is our whole first part of photosynthesis. And we call this entire first part the light reactions or the light cycle. And this is because in order for this to happen, you had to have the sunlight. Sunlight kicked off the entire thing. The sunlight excited the chlorophyll molecule, releasing that charged electron, which did the act of transport, which led to the production of the ATP, and also the leftover energy led to the production of the NADPH. Meanwhile, in order to replace it, we had to split this water molecule. That oxygen got released as waste. So this is the light cycle. This is the part where all of the energy is produced. Because if you think about what went in, two things went in, sunlight and water. And if you think about what came out, Two things came out, NADPH and ATP, our stored energy. Now, you've probably remembered from when we were talking before that photosynthesis 
produces sugars, and we have not gotten to the sugar production yet. The sugar production happens in the second part of photosynthesis, and this is what we call the Calvin cycle. And so in the Calvin cycle, you're going to bring in three ingredients. We're going to bring in the ATP that got produced in the light cycle. We're going to bring in the NADPH that got produced in the Calvin cycle. And we are going to bring in some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So all three of these are going into the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle is basically a way of rearranging chemical bonds, taking this carbon, this oxygen, and the hydrogen that is stored up there in the NADPH. And after lots of chemical rearrangement, turning it into C6H12O6, which is our sugar, glucose specifically. So once that's happened, you also have left over the things that all of the energy came out of. You also have your ADP left over, which can go back here to be filled back up again in the light cycle, and the phosphate that came with it. And you also have more of your NADP+, plus, which can then get recycled back up there in the light cycle. So these two, we're not going to count it in our finalized reaction because they are continually being used and reused. It's like your wallet. When you're thinking of how much money you have, you don't include your wallet in the equation. You just include the money inside of it. It's the same thing with energy. This is like our empty wallet. That's like our full wallet. Empty wallet, full wallet. And it's going to cost you all of that saved up energy to be able to build a complex molecule like sugar. So those are going to be empty at the end of it, and we'll have to send them back to the light cycle to get filled up. Now sometimes the Calvin cycle is referred to as either the citric acid cycle because of the chemicals that are in there. It's also sometimes thought of as the dark reactions because sunlight is not required in order to do this portion of it. So some plants, they can do the light reactions all day long and then at night take that stored up energy, take in some carbon dioxide, and make their sugars. So these are not light dependent. These are light dependent. Okay, that's the basics of the process. Hope you got it.